Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here hosting many sessions of which this is the first. This is about research collaboration, how institutions across the world are involved in scientific research with asteroids. And I want to start with you, Ed. Um, you are uh, involved in the new institute, the B612 Institute, the Asteroid Institute. Could you tell us a little bit about that institute? Our institute, the, the Asteroid Institute, is working on the general problem of asteroid impacts on Earth. And that really means f helping to develop technology to find and track asteroids, as well as the, the ability to compute accurately where those uh, orbits are going to take those asteroids that you find. Because the issue you want to be able to address is, will any of those asteroids hit the Earth? And if so, when and where? And so, so we can do something about it. And in terms of um, international collaboration in the Institute, how important is that? That is huge because no single group can, can do everything. So we are collaborating with institutes like the University of Washington and the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope and uh, with uh, JPL and with uh, other uh, researchers around the world on this problem. So it's truly global. It really it has is. to be. Ian, um, you're the Asteroid Impact Mission Manager. So again, that, that's a, a big international mission. Can you give us a, a snapshot of that? Um, well, you know, the Cold Era uh, space race has finished and uh, the agencies are working now together. And I think the ISS is a fantastic, the International Space Station is a fantastic example of that. And we're building on this type of uh, collaboration, international collaboration to work on uh, deflection and uh, asteroid uh, threat mitigation. Now, the thing is, this is a global endeavor, and as a such, any mission that we want to build has to be international. So we've been working on the asteroid by mission at ESA, and NASA has been working on the DART. These are two missions that combine together, have the objective to demonstrate that we can actually deflect an asteroid. Yeah. Now, uh, Mario, you're um, Associate Professor of Astronomy um, at uh, University of Washington. So, so again, um, can you just set the scene for everybody watching today about the the importance of the worldwide collaboration in astronomy yeah. and asteroids. I think it's, uh, it's impossible to underestimate how important it is. I mean, one of the things that, that I'm working on is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is a project to build a telescope that will essentially be a search engine for the sky. And we're talking about a project that requires something like 300 people just to build. And then to, to do the science with it, everything from asteroids to dark energy, we're having science collaborations that are grow to have grown to about 600 people or so and they're everywhere so we have people from chile we have um, the united states we have groups in europe uh, we have groups in china and everywhere that's just how the science is done these days and i want to bring in patrick um, you're a planetary scientist um, planetary defense asteroid science so so again could you set the scene for how you collaborate from france yeah i think we passed from a, an era of competition with an era of cooperation. And in fact, now all these problems are uh, um, studied internationally. And this is proven also with the space missions, because even when one agency makes a space mission, there are many foreigners that belong to the science team. And I'm a good example, but I have other colleagues who belong to the science team of Osiris Rex at NASA, Hayabusa 2 at JAXA. They are American and Japanese mission, and yet there are European people working on it. So in fact, now science has no frontier which I think is great. And the, the same for the deflection mission that uh, Jan was talking about. We have now working groups, which not only include the people directly involved in the missions, but also people from South America, from China, etc. because now we all understand that if we want to improve our knowledge, we need to work together. And I just have an example of this. This is a book, Asteroids 4. This is a, a book I was a lead editor. It contains 900 pages. This is a review of all our current knowledge of asteroids. It's from 2015, and there are 150 authors, and I don't count the co-authors and the reviewers, etc., all from different nationalities. And the good thing is that even in research, in research, we want to be the one that find first, right? Uh, still, we are okay to share the knowledge. It's a fair competition. We like to work together. We like to compete, but at the end, we share everything because we want to understand the world and the asteroids. It's, it's a very important, uh, important point, actually, isn't it? When I know when I talk to people about the space station, we talk about the science that's done there. Um, but virtually everybody who works on it says perhaps the most important thing is it is a global endeavor. It's one of the few places. CERN is another example, actually, Absolutely. where and I think everybody it's, comes together. It's a good message in a 
geopolitical context which is, uh, you know, a little difficult, for the researchers it doesn't matter. We work for the same cause and it's also a cultural experience because you learn scientifically but also culturally because you work with totally different cultures and this is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, Naomi, you're also, you're the, uh, I'm going to, this is my um, French pronunciation here, the Institut Supérieur de l'Aéronautique de, uh, de l'Espace. IFE, if you like. <laughs> that would have been easier. <laughs> so again, um, it, it is an international institute Absolutely. It's based in France. Yeah. yeah, it's an international institute based in France, in Toulouse actually, it's an engineering school down in Toulouse um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today in terms of collaboration is actually the co collaboration between people doing uh, numerical work in our field, that means using computers to do models and people that are also doing experimental work. Uh, and this is a really important collaboration in the field of asteroid research. Um, the reason being that we can do experiments. Of course, they're an incredibly valuable tool. They give us a lot of insight into science and the world around us. But sometimes there are things that we just can't study using experiments. So for example, if we want to study the environment in space, or if we want to study what's happening on the surface of an asteroid, we can't do that with experiments. So we really need to rely on numerical models from our computer simulations. And of course, with computer models, we can put gravity to be any level we want. Uh, we can make an asteroid of any size and shape. So it's, it's easy to, to do the experiments that we want. But one of the main questions is, how do we know that these models are actually reproducing the correct physics and that they're, they're, they're showing what they should be showing? And that comes back to the collaboration between the people that do these numerical models and the people that do experiments. So the best way to show that your numerical model is working correctly is to work with experimentalists and to demonstrate that all of the correct physics has been captured in your numerical model. And then once you've done that, you can take that and you can extrapolate it to these exotic and inaccessible environments that we can't get to with experiments. Mm. And one of the perfect examples of this would be the, uh, the NASA DART mission, actually, that's going to impact the asteroid, especially if we have the AIM mission beside it to watch what's going to happen. Because this is going to be a large scale impact experiment that we can then use to validate all of these numerical codes from researchers around the world to be able to help us better prepare asteroid deflection in the future. Yeah, and, and speaking of spacecraft, Roger, you're a professor of aerospace engineering. Yes. So um, that's presumably spacecraft design. Exactly. I mean, I, of course, uh, and at the, at the Institute, uh, we have the engineering perspective. And uh, we are looking into missions to asteroids. Let it be mining, let it be science, let it be uh, deflection. And we are speaking of collaboration. And also for us, from the engineering point of view, bringing these things to reality, we need to collaborate a lot with the scientists because we need to understand the environment, we need to understand how the asteroids behave, how they are, how the environment is there. And for us it is very important to do that, to, to collab collaborate with, all, uh, with the scientists all around the world. We learn a lot and only with this we are able to build missions that are successful. So we can't do it alone. So I think throughout the day um, we're, we're going to be talking to people from all over the world and can you characterize this community is is the asteroid community a single object i think this is what i wanted to say that the the great thing with asteroids is that it put together very different communities and they are interested in asteroids for very different reasons you could be interested for the science for the risk for resources they constitute and you need scientists, engineers, I would say scientists, uh, modelers and observers. So it's, uh, it's absolutely amazing the number of communities, not only the inter international component, it's even in one country. You have industries, you have modelers, you have experimentalists, you have observers, you have, and this is what makes this field so rich. And plus you discover that, okay, you are maybe interested to know about the origin of the solar system. Another one is more like, hey, be careful because they, sometimes they fall on us, so I want to study how to mitigate. Another one is, hmm, I can do some business with that, maybe I, I could use them as a resources. But at the end, you need the same knowledge because our knowledge is so poor currently, so whatever you do and whatever you learn from a space mission, for instance, or for an observatory, will serve all the areas. So that's why it's different communities for different reasons, but the, the goal is essentially the same. Ed, you must, I mentioned the space station earlier, actually, because you spent, was it six months 
on the space That's station. Correct. So, so th that, that is working at times in one of the te most tense international situations, I suppose, between Russia and the United States and others. So how, how did you feel that that project itself, the space station, brought countries together? Is that a model for countries collaborating? I think the ISS can be a model for these types of collaborations because it has a mission in the same ways that um, the collaborations maybe have a mission to find a track asteroids or to determine uh, some some uh, something about uh, some one some some scientific question about asteroids, and that that overarching mission is what allows groups from varying countries to come together to work towards a common goal. Uh, when you have that, it allows you to, in some sense, ignore the noise, and 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 consider what's important because you have a common mission. Yeah, I think we have some tweets actually, some questions from uh, Sabinia. So Sabinia, do you any Thank questions you. from out there? Thank you, Brian. Um, not that many questions, just some great sort of quick tweets. Friday, it's Asteroid Day and, you know, the encouragement of that. So I want to keep on encouraging all viewers, you know, go use the hashtag Asteroid Day Live and send in your questions. And while I'm here, I'd just like to mention a bit about the program that we'll have when we're concluded at 6. NASA will be going on 6 p.m. Central European time. And of course, there's also an additional, if you want to look at a movie, we have the rescreening at 9 p.m. and that's Eastern Central Time with the jet from the Japanese space agency Yaka. So a few bits and pieces and back to you Brian. Thank you. Um, Ian, you, we mentioned um, AIM there as one of the big and you also mentioned it as one of the the big missions. So could you give some background to the the advances you might hope it would make and perhaps which models it might rule out of Naomi's? Or <laughs> what Naomi was saying indeed was that um, we can do as much modeling as much research on ground but at some point you need to validate and there's no better way and actually it's absolutely needed to to go into space and actually carry out a proper experiment at the full scale that you cannot reproduce on earth so that was the main uh, objectives of this of this collaboration and the best time to do it is when there's actually no threat, right? Mm. Uh, you're not going to wait to find an asteroid that is on a collision course with the Earth uh, to set up such, such a mission. So we're working through all the um, international agreements, the research teams. We have uh, amazing research teams in Europe, in the US, and even China and Japan supporting us. Uh, who are working with a really great, great uh, collaboration and spirit. Because to be honest, when you work in this type of projects, I've been working on it for 10 years, you really think that it's humanity that's at, at its best, literally. Yeah. It's uh, science across borders, agencies uh, with uh, that beyond politics. You know, governments, so many governments have changed throughout the AIDA project. So we asked for the funding at the ministerial conference. This is where our ministers in Europe meet to decide every four years uh, the next big space projects. Uh, we got to a certain level of funding. We couldn't get all of the funding we needed. So we're looking actually at the moment to uh, redesign the mission in a way that would be cheaper and more affordable to be able to present it to the next council, which will be 19. It's interesting that you mentioned there that um, it's better to do it now and practice now before there's an asteroid on an impact trajectory. Um, we saw Rusty earlier actually said that um, you know that there's a lot of some misinformation out there and noise, and one of the reasons that Asteroid Day exists is to get the science through. So, do you find that it's a challenge when, when perhaps any of you, when you're speaking to governments, to say, well, this is actually not. Armageddon with Bruce Willis. This is actually the, the, there's a reality here in terms of threat, albeit a small threat on a year-to-year -year interval. D do you find that difficult? It's, it's interesting because uh, the perception is very different from one country to the other. There are some countries which are who are very concerned about this risk. Some other countries who essentially don't care. And the reason for that is because it is a low risk, of course, compared to many other natural risks. But the important message is the fact that this is the only one that we can predict and prevent by feasible means. Basically, uh, we need to predict, uh, make the inventory, which can be done in principle, and we need to make a deflection test. And if you do a deflection test, you can verify at least the techniques 
then you can tell the people, okay, you know, we have this risk and now we know how to mitigate it. And I think that would be a very positive message. But of course, this is always the problem when you have a risk of low probability and high consequences. Then some people may think, okay, then I don't care. Some others may think it's important. And you verify that with the politicians around the world. This is why it's so difficult to, to get a mission, which for me, I mean, is so obvious that it's needed because, uh, I mean, it's like when you build an aircraft, before setting it, you make a test, even though the equations tell you it will fly, just because you need to verify that you are, you are okay with what your assumptions. Mm -hmm. You need the same with the deflection test. You, you need to make a test. Moreover, as I said, each mission learns, tells us a lot uh, scientifically also. So any mission will serve many purposes. Whether it's a deflection test, of course, the priority will be to verify uh, technology, but we'll see a new world again. And for the moment, each time we saw an asteroid, it turned our understanding on our head. It's totally crazy. Each time we say, wow, because they defy our intuition. They are in a low gravity environment. So I'm sure that if we do this mission, first we can tell the world, okay, we verify the techniques, and then we have a lot of food for the scientists because we still have a lot of knowledge. Yeah, it's a it's a it's not an easy it's not an easy thing to to, to talk about um, both to the public and policymakers because you're, you're talking about something that's potentially extremely dangerous, but that happens you know once in every sixty million year, million years or so, and that's something that we as humans aren't really good at at perceiving. So one of the things I would try to do is try to speak clearly and rationally about it. And, and try to emphasize the science as, as much as we do the you know, Armageddon-type scenarios. Um, the issue with Armageddon-type scenarios is that you know, 10 years from now, somebody comes back and they've forgotten that you've told them this happens once every 60 billion years. And they ask, well, why didn't it happen already? The first answer is, well, aren't you grateful that it didn't? Um, but we try to talk about the science and what is it that we can learn about the science of the solar system from asteroid and not just, not just the planetary impacts. And that, that seems to have a good effect. That, that, that 60 million years ago, that's an extinction level event, isn't it? I mean, something like Tunguska um, will, will cause a problem for a, a city or even a small country. So what's the, just to set the scene, you said 60 million there, but what's the probability that something quite nasty can happen, the smaller okay. Tunguska size asteroids. Yeah, they are, uh, Tunguska event is about every, okay, 100 or 1,000 euros impact frequency. We have yeah. error bars, of course, in astronomy. And not, I, mean, I was going to say not in finance, but also in finance, they have error bars. <laughs> so, uh, so it's about, uh, yeah, on, on a civilization time, it happens, right? Yeah. The, the thing is, luckily, uh, the, the Earth is uh, covered by two thirds of water and a lot of desert. So still, the probability that it happens over a, a city is, remains very small. So it happened once with Shelia Beans in 2013. Yeah. That was the first one. And this kind of event, 20 meters, 10, 20 meters, is about every century. Fortunately, most often over another area. But now we know that it can happen. We need to think about what we can do in order to maybe evacuate, anticipate, etc. The thing is, we know it happens. On the long run, it will happen again very badly, very long run, fortunately. And as a scientist, I feel responsible that when I know something and when I know I can fix it, I mean, of, of course I want to fix it. Moreover, when it doesn't uh, require an astronomic amount of budget and uh, resources that we don't yet have, we have all the knowledge, all the maturity to try something. So that's why I think it's very important to do it now, even though the impact probabilities of a big event are very small. Naomi, in terms of the simulations that you work on, are you working on deflection simulations there or simulations um, of the so sciences? Actually, so I work a lot more on simulations that are, that are lower impact simulations because the dark impact that we're talking about is an incredibly energetic impact because we want to try and move this entire asteroid in space. And it's actually Patrick who does more of these types of simulations. Yeah. Um, so, but I had a chance to be able to do a lot of smaller impact work with, uh, with numerical simulations and experimental work work as well. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, it's, I could go on forever, but we've run out of time for this particular panel. Lots more throughout the data. I know you're all joining, joining me again at some point, but for now, thank you. And uh, over to Zabinia. Thank you, Brian, and thank also to this knowledgeable panel of experts that we just heard. So now I think it's time for a Skype call, and if everything is working out, I think we have Daria Bodan from Astro Day in Belarus. Are you with us? Yes, we are here. Hi. How's Hi. it going? Wonderful. What are you up to over there? <laughs> we have already had an interview with Nicole Stott, a NASA astronaut. We're excited. You, we have your image on our dome because we are in Minsk Planetarium. 
and we are all waving our hands to you. We have two more lectures about asteroids in the evening, and currently we have also a lecture about Minsk Lancerum Club of young adults who find their asteroids. And we have a contest about finding asteroids with Belarusian names. And in the evening, we are very waiting for the award ceremony, which is also will be conducted on Minsk Lancerum base. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you for that. Time flies, and we have to fly over to Astro Day in Cyprus. George, are you with us? George, are you with us? Hello there. Hello. Yes, I'm with you. Hello from Cyprus. Hello from Luxembourg. <laughs> How are you? Happy Astro Day. Thank you. Oh, happy Astro Day. Finally, that, the same to you. So tell us, what are, what are you up to on this day? Okay. Today we've got the main event. We represent Cyprus. Uh, we're going to have a welcoming speech from me, and uh, we, it's going to be under the auspices of the mayor of Lanaka and some military, uh, military police and people from the parliament. And we have some schools coming as well, and general public. Uh, we're going to connect with astronaut Dorin uh, Prunariu from ESA, six, 10 past 6. Then we're going to have, connect with Neoshield 2 project, uh, Ms. Vanella Romanello. And then we're going to connect again with uh, Dagi Silasiu, which is um, national coordinator for, the regional coordinator for Asteroid Day Greece, okay. and also a member of the International Meteoritic Com uh, Committee and Neoshist uh, Thank you, George. You have a, you have a so busy schedule. To, to talk to us about dentistry. George, he has a busy Enjoy schedule. You. And unfortunately, we have to leave George. But fortunately, we fly over to Stuart, who now will have a one-on-one -on -one with Susan mckenna Lawlor. Thank you, Sabinia. Yes, when it comes to asteroids and understanding them, uh, there's the case both for seeing them from the ground and for sending spacecraft up to uh, survey them from close up. And I'm very pleased to introduce Susan mckenna Lawler, who has spent uh, her career working on missions to go to comets, the icy um, cousins of asteroids. Now, you worked on instruments for the European Space Agency's Giotto spacecraft and the recent Rosetta spacecraft as well, which memorably landed on the comet. And I believe you were in one of the German tracking stations at the moment of that landing. What did that feel like? Well, it was a tremendously exciting adventure to be there and it was the culmination of about 13 years of effort because we had about three years to, co to design and construct and test what was going to fly, 10 years in the cruise phase and then there we were on the surface. And it was planned that the lander would attach itself in a nice smooth place and harpoons would shoot in and it would be there. But that didn't happen. It, it, the lander bounced and started flying at a great speed across the, the planetary landscape. Now, the exciting thing for us was that a lot of material had been thrown upwards by the impact. And we had two exhaust tubes which were looking down at the surface and into the exhaust tubes went this wonderful dust. Mm -hmm. And so we got an absolutely splendid spectrum in quite a different way than had been expected. But we have been working on it and we'll be working on it for another decade. And these surprises that things can happen by accident, but you still get good results out of them, that's part and parcel of space research, really, isn't it? Oh, yes. So uh, we live on the edge of the unexpected. <laughs> so it's absolutely thrilling when you're at that point in a mission. And you're going to be looking at things from a slightly different angle with the next mission that you've worked on, which is the European Space Agency's Bepi Colombo mission. So. And that's uh, launching very soon, I believe. Uh, that will launch uh, presently, yes. There are two spacecraft. One is being launched by the European Space Agency and the other one by the Japanese Space Agency. My instrument, of course, will be on the European platform. Susan, thank you so much. We'll be hearing um, a lot more um, about these missions from you later. But now thank it's you. time to go over to Gianluca and see how the asteroid search is going. Yes, we are here, Astro Day rocks around the clock and we do the same and we are ready to connect with astronomer Richard Wainscott, part of the PanStars team. So welcome aboard, happy Asteroid Day, Richard. 
I'm afraid that the uh, weather isn't so good in Hawaii. It's uh, very windy. So we have a telescope that has a big um, secondary mirror and we're a little vulnerable to the wind. So the wind is about a little over 50 kilometers an hour. That's above our operational limit right now. So I cannot show you any, any live data. Um, if you'd like to, I have a, an image from the sure. Canada, France, Hawaii telescope that I'd uh, be happy to share with you. Sure, sure. This is part of the astronomer life, you know. When the clouds are up there, really, you can do anything, you know. So please, share. Right. We, we, we'll be very happy to see what you've been done, what you've been yeah. doing these this past days, past nights. So I'm going to share a screen with you, and um, hopefully this will work. Um, so what I'm sh sharing with you now, um, if, if you can kind of acknowledge whether you actually see it, um, is an image from the Canada France Hawaii telescope. Yes. So we cannot see the image, uh, Richard, and I, you I, cannot see it. <laughs> no, okay. unfortunately, I, I wanted to ask you if you uh, right. had a chance to discover something in the past nights before the clouds jumping into the sky, just to know if you had some fruitful nights before this. Yeah, we've had a, a quite a lot of uh, very nice nights up until now. Uh, what I was going to try to show you was an image from the Canada France Hawaii telescope. So we did follow up of a, of a pan stars discovery, and then we accidentally or serendipitously discovered another NEO um, on the same night. Yep. It's sort of basically only about 10 arc seconds away from the, the image we were looking for. Okay, so I, we wish you a very nice night. We hope that the clouds will go away so that you can continue looking for us, the sky serving the heavens to look for near Earth asteroids. So thank you. Uh, thank you again, Richard, for giving us some of your time, and we continue running all around the globe with Asteroid Day. Thank you, Gianluca. And now it's time to go straight over to Natalie in the Science Center. How are things over there? Yeah, things are fine here. Welcome back to the Science Center. And we are standing, as you can see, in front of the chaotic pendulums. And Guillaume, why are they called that way? Well, the pendulums you see in this showcase are called chaotic because their motion seems quite unpredictable. Let's have a look. This is fun. It is. Look, it, it, it's very, very difficult to to, to predict what that one's going to do in a few seconds from now, for instance. Um, quite hypnotizing, huh? Yeah, it's very hypnotizing. I could watch that for hours. It's much better than watching TV. Stay tuned. I was just joking. What have these pendulums to do with the asteroids? Well, as you know, the, the asteroid belt is a quite chaotic place. There are zillions of rocky bodies circling around, sometimes colliding, sometimes even shooting off meteorites in our directions. Uh, that, that's the reason why we're here today, by the way. Um, and can't we just uh, use the laws of uh, physics to uh, uh, predict their behavior? Yes, a excellent point. I mean, um, all the motions of asteroids are deterministic, meaning that uh, you, you can precisely calculate their future motion, provided that you have an extreme knowledge of the initial conditions, that is, the initial speed and initial uh, yeah, position okay. in space. Is this something that we... Uh, uh, okay, we w will come back to this. Yes. Uh, later, yeah. because there is somebody very important coming to the studio.